Welcome, everyone. Um, we're very fortunate to, uh, to reinitiate our uh, speaker series uh, in this, this new normal that we, we're all experiencing now. So I'm glad that we were able to, to carry on our business as somewhat usual here at the CIDP. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Christian Breed. I'm the uh, Deputy Director here at the Center for International Defense Policy. And uh, I'm also an Associate Professor over at the Royal Military College and an adjunct uh, here at Queen's. Um, and I've been fortunate to be part of the CIDP for, for several years now. And I have to admit, this is my first time ever hosting a webinar. So please be kind. Um, but I think this is a great way to kick it off. We've got an expert in the room that's going to uh, discuss uh, a topic that is, is quite um, of the moment. And I think will be of, of interest to, uh, to the folks in, in attendance today. Um, so what I first wanna do though, is just uh, do a bit of housekeeping in terms of how this is all gonna work. And so first of all, when it comes to questions, um, that will be held at the, at, at the end of the, of the talk, but please feel free to post your questions in the question uh, widget or box as it appears on your, on your particular version of the platform, um, as they'll be recorded and curated. And when uh, Dr. Kilford has finished his opening remarks, which will be about 25 minutes or 30 minutes or so, um, they will be pushed to me and I'll pose them on your behalf. And in fact, there's an, an interesting feature here where you can actually upvote particular questions. So you can kind of crowdsource uh, which questions you want to see brought to the fore, which I think is a really interesting feature, and that can be uh, can can be helpful as well. So your questions will get addressed, and they'll be like I said, they'll be curated, and uh, of course they'll be I'll, I'll take care of that and forward them off to uh, to Dr. Kilford. We'll have a bit of a conversation after his opening remarks. Um, and what I would then uh, just like to do is now just introduce uh, who Dr. Kilford is. And so we're very fortunate to have him in attendance today. He's uh, has uh, a 32 year veteran of the Canadian Armed Forces and retired at the rank of Colonel. He holds a PhD in history from Queen's University and has served as an artillery officer at various levels of command and staff uh, within the Canadian Armed Forces and on several overseas missions. Most notably and most appropriate for the, today's discussion is his last post uh, was as the Canadian Defence Attaché to Turkey uh, starting in 2011 prior to his retirement in 2014. And so you can imagine he has lots of expertise in the region and lots to say about what uh, has been going on, not just uh, in the last few weeks, but uh, leading up to it as well and some of the context around it. And he's not only a, a fellow with us here at the CIDP, but he's also a fellow with the Canada International Council and a frequent commentator and analyst on uh, media across Canada and around the world, in fact, uh, when it comes to issues relating to Turkey. So uh, please welcome us to virtually, uh, or please help me welcome virtually uh, Dr. Kilford and uh, over to you. Well, <clears throat> so, uh, well, hi, hi everybody out there and uh, uh, Christian, Stephanie, um, thank you for hosting me uh, here at the, uh, at the CIDP. It's my third time, so I feel honored in the last few years to be able to, to speak and to also talk about an area of the world that I, I really, uh, really love. And um, when I was preparing for today, I, I quickly realized I probably have enough material here for about five webinars that we could run separately, but we obviously we can't do that. We're going to have to uh, really focus and, and pack a lot of information into uh, about 30 minutes. Um, so for those of you out there who are Turkish or uh, experts on Turkey, I apologize if I jump over certain things. And if you are not an expert on Turkey, uh, I also apologize to you because perhaps on occasion there'll be some gaps where you'll be wondering, um, you know, how certain things have, have, have uh, happened, but I'll try my best to make it all work and uh, we'll get to the Q&A and then I can address any specific issues that you might have. So I thought I would just start off today with three slides and then we'll uh, move away from the slides. And so let me just bring those up for you. So always just takes a second. And slideshow. Right, so here we go. We've got three slides. This is the first one, which is gonna basically set the scene and then two more, which are, are maps. So the first thing is, why did I choose this title today? Turkey's Middle East Endgame. And in part I did because I've, I've just finished reading uh, Sean's book that came out in 2015 called The Ottoman End Game. And for me, when I looked across the region, what's happening now, but everywhere, you know, everything from uh, Libya to Azerbaijan, it reminded me of the end of the Ottoman Empire. And that's not to say that I'm implying that it's the end of Turkey, but what we found in that period of, uh, let's say 1911 to 1918, 
the Ottoman Empire uh, being pulled apart in numerous directions, the decision to enter the uh, First World War on the side of uh, Germany and Austro-Hungary, uh, Hungary, and the loss of, uh, of the war, of course. And then you had the machinations of uh, Talat Pasha and Enver Pasha, you know, two of the leading figures in the Ottoman uh, government at the time, uh, chasing enemies internally uh, to the empire and then of course fighting externally. And it, um, it really created some uh, uh, you know, difficult conditions, which of course led to the end of the Ottoman Empire. Now, the question here is what will happen with Turkey, given that we see very similar situations developing in the region as we did way back over a hundred years ago. Now, I thought I would divide this talk, talk into four parts. First of all, um, what does it mean for us as a country? Uh, Canada is not a bystander when it comes to the Middle East, and we'll talk briefly about that. We'll then look at the situation in Turkey and what's happening there. But then very importantly, we'll need to look at things from the Turkish point of view. It's very easy for us to sit, let's say here in Canada or in the West in general and criticize, but I think it's very important that we understand how they see things to then better appreciate how, how we could potentially collectively uh, extract ourselves um, altogether from the current situation we find. And then finally, we'll touch on Nagorno-Karabakh, because um, when I was in Turkey as the defense attache, I happened to be cross-accredited to uh, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Turkmenistan. And I spent a fair time in Azerbaijan, and I, I got a very good understanding of, uh, of what was happening on the ground uh, there. So let's just um, advance to the next slide. And this is a really quick look at the Ottoman Empire, the extent of it at its height. Now I won't pick it all apart as it fell apart, uh, but I just wanted to give you an idea, you know, here it is stretching all the way to Algiers, through Europe, all the way down to the Red Sea, all the way to Qatar, out towards Baku and, and so forth. Um, uh, an empire that students of mine often forget. You know, they think about the British Empire, the French Empire, the Russian Empire, the German Empire, and oh yes, there was an Ottoman Empire. But there we go, there's the Ottoman Empire. And then let's overlay what we're currently seeing in the region as we speak. And what do you find? You find that um, uh, Turkey is heavily involved in the Libyan civil war as are many others. There's a great deal of tension in the Eastern Mediterranean with, uh, with Greece in particular. Uh, Egypt, we um, uh, have uh, very difficult relations between Turkey and Egypt. Uh, Turkey was a big supporter of um, Mohamed Morsi and of course he's overthrown in a military coup by General Sisi. And if you're Turkish and you know, you know even if you're not, you know anything about military coups, you, you can imagine what, was going through the minds of uh, folks in Turkey when they see a military coup take place in a, in a neighbor. Um, and you know, the funny thing is everybody in the West seems to be fine with it. We have Turkey-Israeli relations, which we'll talk about shortly. The Syrian civil war, which has drawn Turkey, Turkey heavily uh, into it. Um, we have the current situation in Azerbaijan. We'll talk about that. We have the blockade of Qatar, which has been in place since June of 2017, and Turkey is heavily involved there. And then finally, we have a good Canadian flag sitting right over top of Baghdad, which will lead us into the next part of my talk. But you can see, if you look at how the Ottoman Empire was, you can see Turkey is, is, is out there. Is it a neo-Ottomanistic policy of theirs, or is it just circumstances that they found themselves in? And I'll talk about that a little later on. So I will stop sharing my screen and move back here and here we go. So let's go with part one, which is Canada is not a bystander in the Middle East. You know, the fact is Canadian soldiers, uh, they fought they, and they died in the first and second world wars in the region. My grandfather uh, with the British fought at uh, Gallipoli and survived, uh, thankfully. So um, many of us have family connections to the Middle East and the fighting that has occurred there in the past. And then we move forward to the post-1945 period and we find that um, uh, Canada becomes heavily involved in UN missions, starting with uh, UNF-1 in Egypt in 1956. 
and then continuing uh, through a long period, Cyprus, 1964, we deploy a substantial number of peacekeepers there as well. Indeed, we still have peacekeepers in the Middle East even today. We have an observer force, uh, the multinational observer force, which is not part of the UN. But when it does come to the UN, sadly, one might say we only have about four or five Canadian uh, Blue Berets involved in UN missions in the Middle East today. It's quite a, a drop in, in the number that we used to have. But then while we haven't been there on the UN side, we have been there in other ways militarily. And by that, I'm referring to the uh, 2011 decision by NATO to essentially remove the government of, uh, of um, uh, Gaddafi, well, Gaddafi's uh, government um, using UN resolution 1973 as a bit of top cover. So ideally to protect civilians in Libya from the government, but in the end involving a complete collapse of all of the institutions in the country. And of course, Canada was involved with uh, quite a substantial number of uh, airplane ships, other bits and pieces, and of course, a Canadian command at the overall mission. We then became heavily involved in Syria in 2012. We were one of the uh, main countries calling for the ouster of uh, Bashar al-Assad. Of course, America and France had a big part to play in that. And um, this led, of course, to um, quite a large um, vacuum being created in Syria and also in Iraq, where American troops began to leave in 2011, uh, which in turn led to the rise of ISIS. And of course, we quickly found ourselves back in the region in 2014, helping to train the Kurdish Peshmerga. And now we command the, uh, the NATO training mission in, in Baghdad. Although, of course, COVID-19 has had an impact on that mission. But before that, we had hundreds of troops serving uh, throughout Iraq in support of the Iraqi government. So it's not a region that we can sort of sit back from and say, well, you know, it's not really us. We were there during the, uh, uh, Gulf, the Persian Gulf War, et cetera, et cetera. We have had a very uh, big role militarily there, but not just on the military side. You know, if you go back to Lebanon in 2006, when uh, fighting there led to the evacuation of a large number of, uh, of folks, at the time, close to 40,000 Canadians registered at the embassy in Lebanon and about 14,000 were eventually evacuated. So we see Canadians um, at, at, at work, uh, living you know, their lives, they're there, and we just seldom uh, don't really think about it. Now, Saudi Arabia, let's talk about arms purchase, purchases and, and sales and whatnot to the Middle East. Saudi Arabia is our number two international customer. A lot of that surrounds the deal to sell the light armored vehicles uh, the 14 or so billion dollar contract. That's not the first contract for us selling light armored vehicles to Saudi Arabia, but it has been one in the news, as I'm sure many of you know. Turkey is our number four international arms purchaser. Um, sales of about 120 million in 2018, and we'll come back to that in a moment. And it's interesting that um, we pour in a lot of foreign aid into the Middle East, but if you look at our international arms sales, if you exclude the United States and then go with everybody else, so looking at our international arms sales, 70% of our international arms sales go to the Middle East. Now, um, since October 2019, we've actually had an arms embargo, not against Saudi Arabia, which some people might think, but in place on Turkey, our NATO uh, ally, and that is because of their um, involvement in uh, northern Syria, you know, their decision to cross the border and uh, uh, essentially seize uh, some fairly large pieces of, of ground uh, in their fight against the Kurdish PKK or Syrian PYD, which they believe, you know, to be the same Kurdish organization. So it was a move on their part for security reasons. And this is an arms embargo that uh, uh, was extended indefinitely in April 2020 and now includes drone technology. And we'll come to that a little later on. Now, while we do have the arms embargo with uh, Turkey, trade between our two countries has been increasing year over year. It was about a, a billion in two-way trade in 2004, and it's now 3.6 billion uh, last year. So we do have... Uh, we do have a lot of uh, a lot going on between our two countries, but there are friction points that have been developing. And now the first, of course, is the arms embargo that I just mentioned. But more 
important, I think, is uh, the friction that's been occurring because of the 2016 failed uh, military coup that occurred in Turkey. Now, the Turkish government blame uh, the, the organizers uh, of that coup, they blame the, the Fethullah Gulen movement, uh, the movement of Turkish Islamic cleric uh, Fethullah Gulen, who lives in the United States, they blame it on his, uh, his followers. And what we have seen from that is, uh, well, tens of thousands of Turks have found themselves uh, out of their jobs or, or arrested uh, for being followers of uh, Fethullah Gulen. But here in Canada, what we found was that a large number of Turks were either here already or showing up and claiming political asylum. So between 2017 and 2019, so three years as an example, just under 5,000 Turkish citizens were granted refugee status, political asylum in our country. Now this is a, a, this is a NATO country, it's an ally of ours um, and we're granting political asylum to um, what, you know, not all of the 5,000 or just under 5,000 were followers of Fethullah Gulen, that is uh, for sure. But from the Canadian government's perspective, that's how they kind of decided to, to treat things and even fast track them. And that 5,000, to be precise, 4,697, um, that was the largest group of, pe of, of people granted political asylum from any country in the world. You know, sometimes you think Iran should be at the top of the list, maybe Eritrea, maybe Venezuela, but in fact, it was uh, Turkey. And uh, if you listen to what the Turkish uh, government has to say here, uh, they are not uh, happy that Canada and many others have been granting political asylum to a, a group of people that they consider to be terrorists. And 2020, year, 2020 has been a strange year for the granting of political asylum. Uh, only. 400 or so Turks have been granted political asylum right now, but a lot of uh, their hearings have been put off. Uh, but that still means that Turkey is in number five spot when you look at the list of countries. So there's a couple of points of tension that I just wanted to uh, raise. Now, what's happening in Turkey itself? I've already mentioned the coup, the attempted military coup in 2016. There's a great debate as to who was behind the coup. I can tell you that Gulen members inside Turkey are arrested day after day, last week, probably next week. I mean, it really is creating a lot of uh, internal instability, especially in the armed forces where you're not quite sure from day to day if your counterpart uh, at the death's nest you will actually be there and they haven't been arrested because they've been found to be a, fall, a member of, uh, of, of the Fethullah Gulen network. So the coup may have ended, the state of emergency may have ended, but the internal issues surrounding that coup have, have not gone away. Now, um, I will say there have been endless uh, articles, lots of speculation on who was behind the coup. I tend to believe myself that it was the followers of Fethullah Gulen. There are lots of others that would disagree, but I think we can all agree that it created a, a very unsettling situation in Turkey, which is uh, very used to having military coups. And at the end of the day, no matter who you might think was behind that coup, the fact is a bunch of military people got into fighter jets, climbed into tanks, and attempted to overthrow the government and killed 250 of their uh, fellow citizens and uh, wounded thousands more. It was a very ugly day, uh, two day period, and it still is lingering over Turkey as, as we speak. Um, the presidential system introduced in 2018 has centralized decision-making in Turkey to a high degree. There is an opposition and there are plenty of new parties but largely uh, today, I, I find them quite ineffective. And the fact is the media is largely government controlled or sympathetic to the government. Now, um, there are times when you think that um, uh, democracy may have disappeared entirely in Turkey, but there has been a bright spot recently. And that was last year during the municipal elections in which the opposition party uh, won all of the major cities. And there was a runoff in Istanbul because the initial vote was seen to be 
contentious. And when the runoff was held a few months later, uh, Ekrem Imanilu, um, he won uh, Istanbul, Erdogan's city, if you like, uh, by a very wide margin. So if you are um, a member of the AK party, you would have to be a little concerned about the shift to the CHP, certainly at the municipal uh, level. I think though, um, what we are seeing because of Turkey's involvement in numerous conflicts around the region, uh, the unrest at home, uh, certainly after the attempted coup, um, it paints a very worrying picture for foreign investors. And we are seeing the fall of the Turkish lira because of this. And a lot of the underlying problems are not going away. Uh, people doubt the independence of the central bank and therefore foreign investors are just not willing to, to invest. I'm also mindful while we're talking about Turkey and touching on the economy, that we are approaching the 20th anniversary of Black Monday, which uh, was uh, 19 February, 2001, 20 years ago, when the prime minister at the time uh, came out in front of the media and said that Turkey was facing serious economic crisis. And this created panic and an economic crash, which required an IMF uh, bailout and some very deft stick landling after 2001 by uh, the noted Turkish economist uh, Kemal Dervish to, to start uh, putting the economy back together. And um, it was his work and uh, a desire for Turks for change that led to the rise of the AK party, their winning of the election in 2002, and they're still in power. When it comes to Turkey's economic collapse though, it's, front, it's been front page news for many, many years. But I, I, then again, I think that it's getting harder to avoid that, the, the fact that Turkey is heading for a serious currency collapse that will require some outside intervention. And while all, of their, while all of this is being wrestled with by the government in Ankara, added to the challenges that they face, of course, is the fact that they're hosting under temporary protection some 3.6 million Syrian refugees. I think most people listening in today would be well aware that this is the largest group of refugees being hosted by any country. And they're well aware that Turkey's been doing uh, a, a really a, a fantastic job. Um, uh, if not the government, at least uh, the Turkish people, everybody has pulled together. There are tensions between the two communities, that's for sure. But, you know, look at this. Every single day, so by the end of today, 500 Syrian babies will have been born to their Syrian presence in Turkey. Every day, 500. And if you are uh, in the Turkish government, you're just looking at this and saying, how am I going to take care of this? How am I going to look after these people? They're not able to go back to Syria. That's, that's just uh, not going to happen. And so um, it puts a huge strain on the Turkish uh, security uh, world. The, uh, the health care has to be provided. Education has to be provided. And the fact is, if in Turkish society today, you say that, uh, you know, we've got to look at in integration of the Syrian refugees that are here in Turkey. Well, you know, that's, that's toxic in public discourse. Uh, but after five, six years of Syrians being in, in Turkey, uh, you have to think that um, uh, some sort of integration has to take place. And I think you are seeing that with uh, more and more Syrian children moving into the Turkish uh, school system. Now elsewhere, uh, the Kurdish PKK, and you have to look back to sort of that period of 2015, 2016, where we saw fighting that uh, on a scale that we had not seen before inside Turkey, it's um, now become, it's largely silent. It's not over. Uh, it, it, the, the fighting in the Southeast against the Kurdish PKK draws in hundreds of thousands of security personnel that have to keep an eye on things. Um, but while the fighting in the Southeast may uh, be at a low, uh, uh, well, at, at, let's say simmering, because uh, people have their eyes focused on what's happening inside Syria, uh, the fact is that um, the Kurdish H. DP, the Kurdish political party, which sits in, in, in parliament, but also has uh, uh, lots of mayors in charge of uh, uh, towns and villages and so forth in the southeast, especially. Um, most of those mayors have been removed by the Turkish government over claims uh, of their links to the terrorist group, the PKK. And this is, uh, again, now um, 
when you're when you're putting state appointed officials now in charge of Kurdish what are primarily Turkish Kurdish villages and towns, this is creating another another source of of tension inside the country. And er, all of this explains why uh, the search for uh, good old distraction has been necessary on the part of the government, I think. And so we've seen these forays into Syria, tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, support to the Libyan government in Azerbaijan. Uh, and on a smaller scale, the, for example, the opening of uh, Hagia Sophia to, to worship. But I think all told, when I look at the region, um, what I find interesting is that Turkey is simultaneously opposing the United States, France, Russia, it really depends on the grid square you're talking about. And apart from Azerbaijan and Qatar, I think it's safe to say that Turkey has absolutely no other friends and allies that it could call upon in a fix. But if you are Turkish, of course, you have your view of things. And I think it's really important to uh, just take a few moments and explore that. A lot of people today talk about neo-Ottomanism. Is this Turkey's grand plan to get back to the old days of the Ottoman Empire? Or is it more circumstance-based, which I tend to think of? There's no question that the Turkish government is interested in a revival of the Ottoman period and its history, and, and why not? It's your history. And it's been pushed away and pushed down too long. So I think that makes perfect sense. But when I look in the region, and when I see Turkey accused of neo-Ottomanism, I actually think all of this is actually, it's been created by us. It's been created by the West. You know, why is Turkey helping the Libyan government? Well, I mean, Turkey had a lot of investments in Libya before the civil war took place and Gaddafi was removed. And now if they were to look at Libya, they would simply say to you, well, we are supporting, yes, we have vested interests there, but we are supporting the UN recognized government against a warlord, General Haftar. So if for us, it makes perfect sense. And we also have to think about things such as the Arab Spring itself. When the Arab Spring was taking place and lots of countries were becoming unstable, it was the West that was telling Turkey that they were the model for the region, that they were a modern uh, Islamic democracy, a model of fusion, and therefore other countries in the region should turn to them. So if you're sitting in Ankara and you're hearing this, you're thinking, well, obviously we do have a role to play. So it's a historical role um, and therefore let's get, get to it. So I've already mentioned Turkey and Libya. Uh, I've mentioned previously Turkey and Egypt, of course, um, and, and uh, the resistance to the arrival of Sisi on the scene. If you're in um, thinking about Syria, well, it was the West that attempted to de destabilize the Bashar al-Assad uh, government. Of course, Turkey jumped on that. I remember being there at the time in those early days of, of 2011, 2012, we all thought that conflict would be over very quickly. It didn't. And since then, Turkey has been left holding the bag. And so of course they're very upset about that. It seems everybody else has left and they've got better things to do. Um, Qatar. So it was Saudi Arabia that put the blockade on Qatar in June, 2017 along uh, with some of its uh, regional allies. And of course, Qatar is a source of foreign direct investment in Turkey. That blockade came about very quickly. A lot of people were worrying how they were going to even eat the next day. And of course, it was Turkey that came to the rescue with plain loads of uh, food and also some military support. And then Turkey wonders why they are always getting the finger pointed at them when um, Jamal Khashoggi is assassinated at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in 2018, and nobody really seems to care. There certainly isn't an arms embargo against Saudi Arabia by Canada, as an example. And of course, when it comes to Greece, well, longstanding historical issues there, and, uh, but you know, from a Turkey's point of view, if they look at the map, they feel that they have been uh, surrounded by Greek islands, that they're cut off and, um, 
and this is completely unfair. Well, um, one could say it is what it is. And in fact, at some point, they're going to have to sit down because the EU has threatened sanctions against Turkey. They are Turkey's major trading partner, so they do carry a lot of clout. And if you've been watching the US State Department uh, recently, their release on 13 October was quite a threat in a way to Turkey. Uh, telling them, and I'll just read from it, 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 it's pointedly said, coercion, threats, intimidation, and military activity will not resolve tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean. We urge Turkey to end this calculated provocation and immediately begin exploratory talks with Greece. Unilateral actions cannot build trust and will not produce enduring solutions. Now, America's already mad with Turkey anyway, because Turkey bought the S-400 air defense system and recently tested it. Now they'll say, well, you wouldn't sell us a system, so we had no choice. And they'll also say Greece operates the Russian S-300 system, so why are you picking on us? And Greece also has the low-level Tor M1 air defense system. And, um, you know, so they make a good argument there, but sadly, I think at the end of the day, they spent $2.5 billion on an orphan system that I'm not sure they'll ever really be able to deploy effectively. And the way I see that purchase, sadly, is um, a bit of uh, compensation, compensation that they had to pay for shooting down a Russian fighter jet in November 2015, and for the assassination of Andrei Kolov, the, uh, um, the Russian ambassador, uh, Karlov, I mispronounced his name, Andrei Karlov in, uh, in December 2016, who was assassinated in Ankara by a Turkish policeman. So. This was perhaps just one way of trying to balance things out in that relationship. Now, Turkey gets very upset with Israel. You would have seen that uh, recently. They actually got very upset with the Arab world as well uh, over um, recognition of Israel by the UAE and uh, Bahrain. But um, I think, um, you know, it, it's fine if Turkey uh, it, sort of calls out on their Arab neighbors as. Um, as abandoning the Palestinian cause, but Turkey has had itself relations with Israel since 1949. Trade has continued to increase uh, between the two countries as well. And this whole business, this tension with the Arab world has led some commentators, and I picked this up the other day uh, with one commentator saying, and I think quite close to the mark, that uh, in the Arab world, the sentiment is no longer anti-Israeli, but more so beginning to become anti-Turkish. Very uh, interesting uh, there. And lastly, uh, my uh, last point is what's happening in Nagorno-Karabakh. Well, it's complicated. Um, that's easy to say. Now, um, Azerbaijan and Armenia had been fighting over Nagorno-Karabakh for uh, well over 30 years now. And it is a, it's a province inside Azerbaijan populated with ethnic Armenians. It's about 20% um, of Azerbaijan's territory uh, that, that is, uh, is, is part of this Nagorno-Karabakh area. And we've had four UN security resolutions back in 1993 calling for Armenia to leave uh, the region and, and return all of the occupied territories uh, to Azerbaijan. And, and when the fighting started, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, and Armenia did take um, uh, and begin occupying quite a large section of Azerbaijan, as I mentioned, we saw about a million people having to move out and be displaced and head towards Baku, and they're still, still there. Um, what I found quite interesting in all of this is uh, Turkey you know, has, has become a major player in this, uh, in this war, and Armenia is accused of uh, illegally occupying uh, this portion of our, Azerbaijan. It, but it, you know, Armenia says, well, we're protecting a persecuted minority. Well, um, that's exactly the argument that Turkey employs in Cyprus uh, in the area that they seize to protect a Turkish minority. So um, a little bit, is it, is it hypocritical? I don't know, but uh, I just thought I'd point, point that out. Now, from the Canadian perspective, we have told the Turks that they should stay out of the whole conflict. But if you know the history, you realize that's not going to happen. We're talking about two countries who see themselves as one nation, two states. And so uh, Turkey will continue helping Azerbaijan in this current conflict. And Canada's had a large part to play. And I say large because um, 
if you've been watching the Bayraktar uh, drones flying over Armenian positions and, and dropping uh, their, their munitions on the Armenian troops, it's been incredibly effective. And the brains, if you like, of the system is the Canadian supplied Westcam. Uh, it's the MX-15D multi-sensor, which sits underneath the drones. And they've been incredibly effective at finding where the Armenian positions are. And then, uh, and then of course, a missile shows up. Now we have now suspended the uh, uh, sales of that technology to, to Turkey. And these drones, if you have been watching them, they have a, an incredible effect. Of course, they're militarily effective in, in the one sense, but the, the information that we get back from them, the, the video, et cetera, it really helps in the propaganda war, which uh, I see playing out right now on Twitter uh, all over the place. So a lot of folks now are looking at this, uh, seeing how things are going. Azerbaijan has advanced into Nagorno-Karabakh and into uh, other Azeri uh, areas that are under Armenian occupation. Uh, they have done well in the low areas. Um, what surprises me is the number of casualties. So uh, the authorities in Nagorno Karabakh are reporting that uh, about 800 to 900 soldiers have been killed so far. And when you look at the overall Armenian population and you compare it to like, our population, that is close to losing 10,000 troops on the battlefield, like Canadians proportionally. This, so this is not a minor skirmish with one or two people being killed. This is a major war. Now, a, a lot of folks in the West are saying there is no military solution to this conflict. And I, I, think, that's kinda, I think that's kind of naive because from the Azeri perspective and the Turkish perspective, they only have one goal, and that is to push the Armenians completely out of, uh, out of that territory. Anything short of that is, is a strategic failure because then it will just lead to um, an endless round of negotiations that won't actually change anything at all. So um, I don't expect, even with the coming of winter, and even though now Azeri troops will have to be fighting in much tougher terrain um, from the lowlands, I don't see how this conflict can wrap up. It if, it if it wraps up in a stalemate, then for all intensive purposes, the Azeri side would have uh, lost. So I'll stop. I covered a lot of grounds. There's no question that Turkey is deeply mired uh, throughout the region. I would say its relations with practically every country are either broken or extremely fragile. And domestically, the search for enemies continues. I would imagine, as we head to the 2023 national election, that the AK Party is very worried about the future. Poor and working class voters, their, work, their base, are being harder hit by the combination of the pandemic and inflation. It makes sense for the AK Party to call elections sooner, but they do not have the majority in the Grand National Assembly to do so. And they would be robbed of the significance of the 2023 election, which will be uh, on the 100th anniversary of the Turkish Republic. But you know, all these big plans that Turkey had, their HEDEF 2023, their goals for the future, the doubling of the GDP, being one of the top 10 economies in the world, top five tourist, decorate, tourist destination, even higher than top five, all of that, they just seem like a very, very distant memory now. And there's a saying in Turkish, it's yurta sulu, jihanda sulu, um, peace at home, peace in the world. And at the moment, that is just simply not the case for Turkey. Okay, thank you. I'll stop here and I'll be pleased to take your questions. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Kilford. Uh, we've been tracking a few as you were speaking. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll just present them um, sort of conceptually, I think maybe the easiest ways to go just in order that they arrived. Um, so uh, the first one that came up, which is um, asking the question about, you know, what's next? And you sort of touched on it towards the, the end of your closing comments here. So what's next? What are some of the possible outcomes that you see Turkey achieving over the next, you know, the, the, the short to medium term, sort of the next five to five years or so? How do you see this all sort of playing out? What are some, you know, in sort of a forecasting language, what are some alternative futures that we could potentially see ourselves in? And yeah. the likelihood of that. Well, well, thank you for that. <clears throat> thank you for that question. And, and, it, and it's really hard because uh, we would like to see solutions all over the place. We would like to see Turkey perhaps, uh, or, or, or Libya, let's take Libya. We'd like to see the Libyan 
um, situation resolve itself with uh, a single parliament. Um, we can get the oil flowing infrastructure can be uh, put back together and it will all be great. We would like to see that. We would like to see a resolution in Nagorno-Karabakh. Ideally, people would be able to, uh, to get along. Uh, that is just doesn't seem possible. We would like to see a resolution in Syria with Bashar al-Assad and, and, and then Turkey could begin extracting itself and not having to, um, you know, to pay for uh, their, their significant military presence inside Syria. And they're also in all those little areas that they have in Syria um, that, uh, that are in Syria proper, they're, they're still paying the health care there and, and the security and the teachers, you know, they, they haven't lessened the burden there at all. We would, so we would like that sort of what is the short term resolution is the question. And I would simply say, I don't see one. And I always use the example of Cyprus. You know, the first Canadian peacekeepers arrived in Cyprus in 1964, and we still have one there with the UN. And that situation, if you were watching elections taking place in the uh, Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, which nobody else recognizes as a country but Turkey, but if you were watching them, they, there's no, there is no resolution. And it speaks to the whole area that I, that I was in uh, and, and having to keep an eye on with uh, Georgia and Abkhazia and South Ossetia, Transnistria, which was outside of my area, Crimea, Crimea the Donetsk, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, these, uh, some people say they're frozen conflict, conflicts, they're almost like perpetual conflicts. And um, they've been going on for 50, 60 years. So, how does Turkey get out of this? And I don't have, I don't have the easy solution, except to say this is going to, 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 to uh, hold them back. You know, the fact is, I mean, at the end of the day, this is holding back a country that has tremendous potential. And um, uh, something will, will, will potentially break at the end of the day. Okay. Well, uh, you know, now I'm going to violate my own uh, my own policy here with questions because there's a question that fell very closely on the heels of as you were speaking that really is is kind of a, a natural uh, sort of part two, um, which is do you think Turkey's overstretched, overcommitted in in some way, sort of economically, militarily through all of these these efforts and and, and challenges it's facing? Yeah. I, I, well, I would I would say first of all that um, you know I love the I love Turkey I love the Turkish people but you would never get a Turkish uh, government official or military official to admit that they were overstretched, right? right. Um, they, they, even privately, they pro probably wouldn't do that. But there are, there are some real issues at play. You know, one of the first things, if, if, you're, uh, if you're in government or if you're in, in, uh, in NATO, somebody will thrust a briefing note into your hand that says, whoa, Turkey has the second largest army in NATO. So uh, you know, immediately you think, wow, okay, it must be really huge. And, and on paper, it is a big military. Um, but looking at the latest figures, you, and it's always hard to tell because um, the military can be secretive at times, but it looks like they have about 180,000 regulars. And the other 200 and something thousand are conscripts who just serve for six months. So they're not really soldiers that you can call on to do anything important. So now you're focused on your professional force of about 180,000. But that professional force, you've got thousands of troops on the island of Cyprus, thousands of troops who are keeping an eye on the Southeast uh, because of the Kurdish PKK threat. Um, you're running the conscription system. And now you're asking the military to, uh, they're involved in Syria, Idlib is a huge concern. You've got troops out in uh, Libya, you've got troops out in Azerbaijan, although uh, the government might say that that's not true. Um, Qatar, uh, some troops there. Somalia, a big presence. And I think, you know, most militaries could handle this, but layered on top of that, of course, is that attempted coup back in 2016, where you're still seeing on any given day, you can pick up the newspaper and see that 50, 60, 70 still serving military officers are being arrested for having ties to the Gulen network. So from a morale perspective, this, this has to be a factor. Now, I mean, I'm telling you, the, the government would deny this and they say, no, 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 it's all in hand. But listen, it, it, it creates suspicion and concerns. And um, 
I do believe that, that they are overstretched and it is, is a challenge. And at some point, something won't go right. Okay. Interesting. Thank you very much for that. Um, the, there's, we're getting quite a few questions here, which is actually really, really cool. There's uh, lots of activity on this. So bear with me as I try to just make sense of them here. And I want to make sure I do them all justice. So if I do miss your question, I apologize, but I'm trying to sort of collect them and, and make sure that they're, they're, we get them grouped and get through everything here. Um, one question that sort of comes up as well that I think is interesting um, is sort of drawing some parallels between the, or, or seeing if there's some, some connections between uh, Turkish experiences with the Kurds. And then is that informing their, their, their views, their policy towards Armenians in the Karbakh? Um, and is there any sort of connection you see there or, or, or the way in which that, that's, that's informing itself or, or perhaps holding back potential options, things like that? I don't see a, a particular tie to uh, Armenians, the, the Armenian you know, pop population there and their own Kurdish issue. I think, um, you know, relations with Armenia have been difficult uh, for a very long time. And we could go back to Talat Pasha in 1915 and talk about that. Um, and then, of course, the border with Turkey and Armenia has been closed since 1993 because of what was happening in Nagorno-Karabakh. So there isn't any traffic going back and forth. Um, so, so you've got that piece. But then you come back to the, 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 the Kurdish issue uh, inside Turkey. You know, you have a large population there, roughly 15, some say even higher percent of the population, perhaps 15 to 20 million Kurds. And, and Turks and Kurds intermarry, so it's not so simple. Um, um, but what we have seen, I mean, there have been some interesting movements in Turkey when it comes to the Kurds. The, uh, we saw the uh, arrival of the HDP, um, the Halk Demokrasi Partisi, in the parliament in 2015, the first time we had seen a, 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 a Kurdish political party. Inside the inside government, of course, that is cause for concern. Uh, if you're if you're a nationalist, you wouldn't want to see this. And then there are other concerns, um, things that we often don't think about, which um, which are um, demographics. We know, for example, in 2018 that the Turkish birth rate in the western part of the country fell below replacement value for the first time. So people are arriving like 1.8 children. Whereas if you go into the Southeast and you look at the Turkish um, uh, government statistics, you see families in the Kurdish Southeast are having three, 3.5 children. And so um, this means that over time, the Kurdish population inside uh, Turkey will grow and the governments of the future will have to um, begin to address, uh, address uh, how they handle that particular issue as well. So there's a, a lot happening uh, that's visible and let's say invisible. Right. Sort of related to that, do you see similar demographic pressures at play in, uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh between Armenian and Azerbaijani and things like the different demographics in that particular region? Are, they, are, there, are we seeing similar dynamics of, of varying population growths based on ethnicity? Well, looking at the NK area generally, no, but um, Azerbaijan has accused Armenia of moving uh, Ar Armenians from Armenia proper into that area, just as we have seen in the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, where Turkey has, uh, Turks have uh, moved into, into the re Republic. It can be quite funny at times because I spent a week there and of course they drive on the other side of the road like they do in the UK. And then you were having Turks from the mainland arriving as uh, new residents and and I remember being with a taxi driver and there was somebody ahead of us driving erratically. And he said, well, he's from the mainland, um, sort of like a Vancouver Island mainland thing, I guess, that we have here. <laughs> but but you have seen these political uh, these moves, these political moves. Um, but the fact of the day, you know, Azerbaijan, uh, roughly 10 million, uh, Armenia at 3 million, uh, the GDP in Armenia, I mean, uh, uh, in Azerbaijan is high. They're a very rich country. Armenia struggles. When I, when I stood on the Armenian-Turkish uh, uh, border back in, I think it was 2014, uh, visiting Ani, a, a, a very important uh, Armenian historical site, I stared across the border um, and I could see on the other side, not Armenian soldiers, but Russian soldiers patrolling that border because a lot of, uh, of the Armenia's uh, young men have headed to Russia to work 
and um, and then the Armenian military just they just it's not that big, you know, so they don't have the resources that Azerbaijan can pull on. Okay. Thanks. For, thank you for that. I'd like to shift our focus now sort of more domestically, if we could. Um, and uh, some questions are, ask, are are coming up about, again, that, that classic connection between domestic politics driving foreign policy. And so we're looking now at, at Canada in particular. And, and what sort of domestic pressures within Canada do you see pushing Canada towards certain policy, like foreign policy um, pronouncements on, the, on this, this issue and just in Turkey in general? Um, how do you see that that connection sort of working out? Well, I think there's been there has been a desire to work towards a free trade agreement with with Turkey and and get our relations onto a really good f footing. And we have uh, signed uh, several uh, lower level agreements uh, up there, up until about 2019, and then COVID came into play and things right. slowed down. You know, we have tried there. Um, the the whole West Cam issue with Azerbaijani and well Turkish drones really has created an issue. The uh, movement by the Turks into northern Syria created an issue for the government to put an arms embargo in place. I thought it was a bit hypocritical that we would put an arms embargo on on Turkey, um, but not do the same for Saudi Arabia. And I saw that purely as, as politics, because at the end of the day, we don't actually sell that much to the Turks in terms of, of, of uh, you know, 100 million versus 14 billion. Right. Um, um, interesting, you know, interests versus values. We could have a good political studies hmm. discussion about that. Um, I, 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 but at the moment, I would sense whether you're in Brussels, certainly in Washington, um, many other capitals in the Arab world are incredibly frustrated with the Turkish government and they're taking a, a hammer to every single problem that they mm. see. But as I say, if I come back to look at things from the Turkish perspective, you know, sometimes it's difficult to argue against them when they say, well, the Russians and the French, the UAE and Saudi Arabia are, are supporting General Haftar, who's a, a Libyan warlord and we're the ones who are helping the UN recognized government in, in Tripoli with assistance. And as we know, even some Syrian mercenaries as well. But, but you, you can, if you took it from their perspective, it, you know, you go, yeah, well, hmm, uh, politics, it, it, but, but they have a point. Okay. Um, there's one sort of observation that's, I think would be interesting to make, and it came from one of the questions early on in the discussion, which is about uh, the source and origins of Turkish military equipment. And um, I think you've, you've touched on a lot of that already in some of your answers, but it seems to me, and you know, please correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's almost like a hodgepodge. It's a, it's a bit of Russian, a bit of Western. Um, and, it, and you talk about like politicized procurement, your, your, your vignette of the S-400 purchase, I think uh, certainly speaks volumes to those of us in Canada that think about um, our own procurement problems and how they get sometimes politicized. And I think, you know, we, uh, we have nothing to complain about if this is the sort of thing that's going on in, in Turkey. Um, yeah. Do you have any, any sort of further details yeah. you could shed on that? Yeah, so very quickly after the uh, Second World War, of course, Turkey was, um, didn't participate until the very end, came in on the side of the allies, but uh, the military was in poor shape and they were the recipient of Marshall Plan 8. So they got a lot of equipment from the United States and a lot of our old equipment. In fact, I was talking to a Turkish retired military officer the other day who had actually served on a minesweeper that Canada had gifted to the Turkish government back in the 1950s. And it was still sailing up until not that, not that long ago. So wow. a lot of the equipment was coming from the United States and from Canada, surplus military equipment. And, um, you know, it all works well. But I think a real turning point was the uh, invasion of uh, Cyprus in 1974 um, by the Turkish uh, military, the government, and uh, many, many countries around the world uh, put arms embargoes on Turkey. Mm. And this was a catalyst for them to begin to lay the groundwork for their own indigenous uh, armaments industry. And I have to say that they've done incredibly well in that regard. I mean, they are building a lot of their own equipment. Sometimes they'll stain it, still need a Pratt & Win, Pratt and Win Whitney engine from us uh, or a camera, um, uh, but their indigenous industries have really, really taken off, uh, but they still um, need to buy fighter jets. And of course, as you know, like the S-400, buying the S-400 
uh, I think it was a waste of money, um, but and, and done for political reasons. But the um, an offshoot, of course, was the uh, having them they were kicked out of the F thirty five fighter jet program. And I have to say, um, I toured many of their uh, incredibly good uh, avion aviation uh, industries, facil their facilities, where they were making parts for the F-35. They make a lot of parts for the F-35. And so this must really, really hurt. And, yeah. and of course, the US Congress, I don't know what will happen after the election, but uh, there are people out for blood when it comes to Turkey in the US Congress for, for buying that S-400 and a bunch of other things. So right. it could get tougher for them down the road. Okay. Um, one other question, just a very particular one is, is are, you, are you able to comment on the official stance of the government of Canada on the 2016 coup in terms of who's yeah. behind and what they're taking on, on it is? You know, okay, so um, we, hadn't, we didn't publish, you know, our, our version of events, so to speak. Right. But for uh, Immigration um, and Refugees Canada, who have to make rulings on the admissibility of, uh, of folks under the you know, political asylum uh, label, well, they needed to know what had happened, right? right? And so a study was commissioned, which is available online, that talks about the coup. Um, it, it, it doesn't definitely come out and say it was one thing or the other, but reading between the lines, it gives um, somebody in the immigration department reviewing a file enough information to say, you know, um, it was the Gulen movement. Right. And that's why you've seen so many people being granted political asylum. That's fascinating. Wow, thank you for that. Um, one other question I've got, it's uh, this is uh, one that the one, one sort of more, more, more Person of, of personally aligned it with some of my interests in terms of uh, you know the, where where conflict is going and things like that. I'm sure you're familiar with Jack Watling's recent uh, Rusi piece on uh, sensors, not shooters, being more important and using the nagorno karabakh conflict uh, and those data points you already indicated um, as an example. And we're sort of seeing that almost as an incubator of sorts of what future conflict may look like. And I was just wondering if uh, you're you're able to, um, you know, this is something that we have to be careful about making too much of in terms of seeing what's happening in that region because you you know they're both reasonably well armed with reasonably te highly high technology equipment. And you already talked about like they're saturated with sensors and drones and things like that that are of, of sort of a world class standard. Mm -hmm. um, do we need to exercise some caution here? Like Watling's very keen in his Rusi paper to talk about how. This is, this is the, the future of war as we see it. You know, we need to disperse, we can't mass anymore. We got to rethink camouflage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or is this just you know, another anecdote that we need to uh, you know, address accordingly? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm coming at that question from the former command, well, not the former, now much older commanding officer of four air defense. Right, here we go, right on, yeah. And, you know, and I, I, had, I had like 20 ADATs, uh, right. you know, surface to air missile systems. and probably 20 of those 35 millimeter cannons with their SkyGuard radars and, yeah. um, and was well aware of, of you know, the threat that the that, that drones possess and the fact that you need to disperse. I've always, oh, it's always been there. You've got to yeah. be able to disperse. You've got to be able to hide. And what you are seeing in the uh, particular case of Armenia right now, and I believe me, I watch way too many of these targeting videos, um, it's like none of those lessons have really uh, sunken in, in the Armenian right. sense. They do have air defense systems, but they are, and I tell, tell the audience that running an air defense network is one of the most challenging, difficult jobs that you can possibly have to get it to all work, to get the radars to work, to hide yourself electronically, to have everybody talking to one another. It's, it's, the most difficult thing you can imagine, I think, in a, in a, in a ground-based um, situation. And if you don't have it right, you will be killed and you will be found. And um, for, for us, we got rid of all of our air defense systems. And I'm not making a pitch to buy more or get more or bring them back, but you do need to think about this. Mm -hmm. You need to bring some kind of jamming systems with you and you need to have some kind of air defense system that you can counter these drones because uh, there truthfully is nowhere to hide on the battlefield right. these days. Yeah, and the paper makes a lot out of the, uh, the advances in radar uh, and the fact that, you know, even a lowly infantry like myself, you know, with a little bit of metal hanging off them is gonna 
is going to give away uh, my position. And, and like you said, you really cannot hide any longer. So I just, I found it an interesting piece and was curious um, if it really is perhaps as, as, as laboratory incubator, like as, as it's being made out to be, but it seems like it's more than anything else, reaffirming some old truths that we needed to maybe be reminded of more than anything else. Well, Christian, the only thing I can say quickly there is yeah. when you have, when you have air superiority, um, like we tend to do in almost right. every single situation. In fact, I don't know where we would show up where we didn't have air superiority. This yeah. isn't a problem. You can still go about your daily business and, right. and gather together and have lunch and not worry about it. Um, but if you're an Armenian or a PYD Kurd in the middle of nowhere without that top cover, then you better get out a little booklet yeah. that tells you what to do because you're in deep trouble. Yeah. And this is where I see the lessons for, you know, the, the, the future of you know, great power competition, where that's, and that's, 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 that's taking us, you know, where those assumptions of air superiority may be a bit erroneous now going forward into the future. Um, yeah. But I think that's, that's a great point. Well, I see, I, th I think we've addressed almost all the questions. I think we've got just about all of them addressed in the queue. I don't see anything new. If, if there's, uh, I'll sort of put a shout out to the community that if, if you know, this is their, their last shot at, at a question to, uh, to Dr. Kilford. Um, and um, so, okay, yeah. So I think we're, we're coming up on full time anyway. So I'm, I'm happy to, to wrap it here. Um, and uh, Dr. Kilford, I just wanna thank you uh, on behalf of the CIDP for, uh, for taking the time out of your schedule to, to talk to us. And if I could virtually uh, thank you and, and or, or you know shake your hand in real time, I'd be coining you right now. We have a challenge coin here at the CIDP, and we'll make sure we send one to you uh, in due course if you haven't got one already. Uh, yeah, I'll that's, add that's it that. to my collection. Yeah. There you go. That's just it, right? So that, that's that's how we how we do business here. Um, so thank you so much, and uh, hopefully everyone here in the in the community found it uh, interesting and as informative as I did. And uh, we'll be in touch, and this will be recorded. Uh, it is being recorded, and this will be posted on our website uh, in the next few days for uh, everyone to consume at their leisure. Take care. Thank you. Thanks so much.